It's about uh, hydrogen beyond the hype. Hanno Berg is a journalist and he wrote about the technologies um, um, that we have uh, and that will help us um, to tackle the problem of climate change uh, over the next years. And without further ado, uh, over. thank you, Hanno. Yeah, hello. Um... Yeah, as I said, I, today I want to talk about uh, hydrogen and how it may be used as a solution to our emissions problems. So there is uh, currently a lot of interest in hydrogen as a climate solution. And you could also say there's a lot of hype. Um, now, uh, if you follow this space a bit longer, then maybe this sounds familiar because like the idea of a, something like a hydrogen economy that, that goes back to the 70s, like where I wasn't even born. But, uh, and then again, it kind of became quite popular in the early 2000s, uh, particularly in the US. Uh, there was a push to, to build cars that drive with hydrogen. Um, but ultimately, uh, not much came out of those previous instances of uh, hydrogen hype, to say. But um, it looks currently that this time this may be a bit different, that this may be a bit more real than these previous instances where hydrogen was discussed as a solution. So... Right now, particularly in the EU and also in Germany, there's uh, from the political side uh, a very strong push in that direction. The EU published a hydrogen roadmap a while ago and also Germany has its own strategy for hydrogen deployment. Um, and I guess this is a number that just uh, shows that this is that this is serious, like the EU has plans to invest uh, 140 billion euro into hydrogen projects within the next uh, couple of years. So that's that that's quite quite a large sum that that's going into this space. Um, and hydrogen is uh, interesting because it it can help us bring down emissions in sectors that are the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors, which basically means it's there's no easy solution to, to make these sectors climate neutral or reduce the emissions substantially. Um, but before we talk about the future and how hydrogen may help us being a climate solution, we, we should talk a bit about how hydrogen is used today and because there already is a, a quite large industry that is using hydrogen. Um, and actually that's quite a dirty industry. Um, so uh, right now hydrogen is usually made from fossil fuels. The, the most relevant method to do that is a process called steam methane reforming. Methane is the main ingredient of natural gas or or you could also say fossil gas. Uh, and there's also some hydrogen that is made from coal with a process that's called coal gasification. And this uh, production of hydrogen today is responsible for around 2% of the CO2 emissions worldwide. So it's, I mean, it's not, not huge, but it, it's quite substantial. So, so right now, hydrogen is more of a climate problem than a climate solution. Um, and the uh, the majority of hydrogen is used in two sectors. One is ammonia production, and ammonia is a an important ingredient for fertilizers. So that is basically used to grow our food. Uh, and the other one is is removal of sulfur within oil refineries, uh, which is uh, of course ho hopefully something that in the future we will get rid of because. We want to get rid of fossil fuels and therefore there shouldn't be any oil refiners anymore. But that's like the situation today. And these are, uh, uh, everything else is not very relevant. These two sectors consume 
basically almost all of the hydrogen that is produced today. Uh, but how could this change in the future? Like, how could hydrogen become a climate solution? Uh, the, uh, what we want to get is so-called green hydrogen, where there's a technology called electrolysis, which is basically we use electricity and that electricity, of course, ideally should come from solar or wind or other clean sources of electricity. And we can use that to, to take water and then we split the water into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so the picture you can see here, that is in an electrolyseur uh, in, in Prenzlau that is north of Berlin at a company called Enatrac that's already be, uh, installed about a decade ago. Um, but overall, hydrogen from electrolysis, that only exists in very small scales today. So it's less than a percent of the global hydrogen production comes from this, uh, this direct electrolysis. Um, yeah, so, okay, but in the future, hopefully this will be more. And as we heard, uh, there, there is quite some investment into this. So what, what can we do with this hydrogen and what should we do with this hydrogen? So one thing uh, that is very important to keep in mind here is that when we do something like we use electricity to split up water, so we're converting the electric energy into, into a chemical energy in the hydrogen. But every conversion of energy introduces losses. We lose some of the energy as heat that goes into the atmosphere. So if we can, we want to avoid this. So, uh, so the, the thing to keep in mind here is that whenever we can use electricity directly without this conversion into hydrogen and maybe then even back into electricity when we use something like a fuel cell, then it's likely better to use the electricity directly. So uh, one thing I really want to emphasize here is that this is not about cars. Like here you can see this a fuel cell car, but this is, uh, this is basically uh, like a lot of people are, seem to be very excited about fuel cell cars, but uh, basically most experts agree that this is not going to happen. And the, the reason is simply that, that you have this efficiency loss. When you, when you have a car with a fuel cell, then you first convert electricity into hydrogen and then you convert it back into electricity and the losses are much bigger than when you use a battery. So, and... Uh, I, I kind of noticed that whenever I write something, an article about hydrogen, then in the, and I didn't write anything about cars, but in the comment section, there will always be a discussion about hydrogen for cars. And so, so I really want to emphasize that, that this is not what this is about. And this is not, uh, almost certainly not where this is going in the future. Um, but there are areas where it's not easily possible to use electricity or where it's even, even just impossible. Um, and there hydrogen can play a role. And one very important sector is the production of steel. So uh, steel today, uh, so when you produce steel, what you have is, is iron ore and that is on a chemical level, mostly iron oxide. So you, you have something which is, a reduction process, which means you you have uh, you have iron with uh, with oxygen, and you need to get this oxygen out. And how you do this today is that you use coal. And the steel industry is currently responsible for around eight percent of the worldwide CO two emissions. So that's that's quite big. And these emissions aren't just energy emissions, but these are emissions from this chemical reduction process. And uh, several companies are currently working on something that is called direct reduced iron that can be used with hydrogen. So this is a technology that already exists today, but today it's usually, usually using natural gas. So it's not really a solution if you do it with natural gas, but you can switch that natural gas for hydrogen and then use hydrogen instead of coal to produce steel. Um, 
the most advanced uh, project is a company in Sweden, uh, SSAB, that uh, they have announced that they want to completely switch to that process within the next couple of decades. But there are a number of companies who are working on this. So, yeah. Um, another sector where hydrogen can be uh, an interesting option is, is the whole sector of chemicals and particularly plastics. So, I mean, plastics today, they are usually made from oil, sometimes also from natural gas, but it's all fossil fuels. Um, and one thing that could be done is that you can use hydrogen and then you need also CO2 and you can turn this into methanol. And then you can use methanol as a basis for all kinds of chemical processes and can produce something like plastics, but also other chemicals. And that could be a replacement for the petrochemical industry. Now, um, a challenge here is that you need CO2 for this. And this, uh, um, there, you need to be careful what, what, what these uh, projects that are trying to do this, what exactly they do. Because you could, of course, say, OK, we, we have too much CO2. We can go to the next coal power plant, and then we get the CO2 from their emissions, and then we make methanol from this. But then you, you're. At the end, whatever you're producing will likely end up in an incinerator and then you have the CO2 emissions again. And also you really don't want to do something that creates an incentive to keep a coal power plant running. And the alternative is to, you could filter the CO2 out of the air, which is a technology called direct air capture, but that, uh, that needs a lot of energy that uh, basically needs a lot of electricity. So that, this this road to use hydrogen for chemicals it can be done but it needs a lot of energy so and it so that makes it quite expensive yeah and other interesting sector for hydrogen is the production of ammonia uh, as i said earlier ammonia is is already made from hydrogen today it's ammonia is made from fossil hydrogen and then you also need nitrogen, but nitrogen is the main ingredient of the air around us, so, so we have plenty of that. Um, so the, it's a very obvious step to say, okay, this ammonia production today, we should switch that from fossil hydrogen to green hydrogen. Um, but also, we, uh, it is discussed whether ammonia could be used as a fuel, for example, and one sector that's particularly looking at that is uh, the shipping industry, like particularly large container ships. There's uh, currently no really good solution for them to make them run on renewable energy, but uh, ammonia is discussed as one option. And it has the advantage of other things like methanol. Methanol you could also use in a ship, but then you have this problem where do you get the co2 from and that if you want to get the co2 from the air it needs a lot of energy and and with ammonia you don't really have that problem because you don't need a carbon atom in it that i put you the chemical formulas here because ammonia is basically hydrogen and nitrogen uh, so that's a an interesting option um and there are plenty of other things where hydrogen could play a role uh, one is aviation. You may have heard that uh, last year there was an announcement by uh, uh, by Airbus that they want to develop uh, hydrogen-powered planes. Distances uh, uh, up to medium distances, but it's probably needed because there's really no. And of course, we, you can reduce aviation, but. Uh, there probably still will be some need for aviation. Uh, so yeah, um, hydrogen may be an option in shipping, but it may also be like for the smaller ships, they will probably be electric. And as I said earlier, for the larger, particularly container ships, they uh, it may be that they will use ammonia. And it's not clear whether there will be an in-between space to use hydrogen directly. Process, but uh, it seems right now that um, um, it seems that this 
Uh, it seems right now that this is uh, may also go into the uh, electric and battery direction. So it's not clear whether this is going to happen. Then you can do all this, what is uh, summarized under this name e-fuels, which means basically you're doing something like diesel or kerosene and make it out of hydrogen. But that you have a similar problem to what I earlier mentioned with the methanol, that you need CO2 and that all of this is very inefficient. And so it's very expensive. So very likely you will only use this in sectors where you don't have an alternative, which uh, is primarily long distance aviation. Um, then also you can use hydrogen for heating, both in industrial applications and also to heat your houses and flats. But it's questionable whether this is a good idea because almost always you can use electricity directly there and that is more efficient. And then there's also the, the whole discussion about electricity storage, like you could use you could use excess renewable energy when you have too much uh, electricity and use that to produce hydrogen. And then particularly in winter, when we have a situation uh, which uh, where maybe there's not a lot of wind and not a lot of sun, and then you need extra electricity for, uh, and then you could use the hydrogen to produce electricity. Uh, the, the problem with that is that this is also very expensive, particularly because it kind of assumes that you have uh, electrolyzer to produce the hydrogen, but you're not running it all the time. You're only running it when you have excess electricity. So this will likely be needed because we need some electricity storage options, particularly long-term storage. But it's also something where you probably want to look at alternatives whenever you can and, and use these before you use this expensive option. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that, that is quite important is to, to realize that the scale of this is enormous. So right now we have almost no green hydrogen and we, we need to grow this to, to massive sizes. And just some numbers to, to get an idea about that. These are numbers are mostly from this German hydrogen strategy. So right now there's uh, 55 terawatt hours of hydrogen use per year in Germany. Um, that is mostly for ammonia and for refineries. Uh, but if we want to convert steel into to use hydrogen, then this uh, it's projected then in 2050, we will need something like 80 terawatt hours. And the whole renewable electricity production in Germany uh, last year, uh, in 2019, the last year where we have the numbers already was 251. And now if you assume we add the, I don't know, we use it for ammonia production for shipping, and then we use it for the chemical industry. And then we also have some losses. Uh, today, they are around 20%. If we have better technology, maybe better electrolyzers will bring this down to 10% losses. But all in all, uh, there, there will be a huge amounts of electricity needed to produce all that hydrogen and likely more electricity than what we use in electricity today. Um, so we need a lot more renewable electricity. I mean, this, this is a very key message. And, and also, uh, I find it sometimes a bit funny when you have politicians, particularly from the more conservative spectrum, when they say, yeah, hydrogen is this great climate solution, but then they are pushing back on extending wind energy and it doesn't really match. Like if we want to go that hydrogen route, and I, I think we, we have to, we will just need a lot more renewable electricity. Um, but also for a country like Germany, where it's just, it's relatively dense and space is limited, then this probably means that we there will be a need to import hydrogen. And th this brings up an interesting question because hydrogen is actually quite difficult to transport. If you want to transport it via ship, you have to first compress it because it's not very dense uh, and that needs extra energy. So an interesting question becomes, if you want, really want to import hydrogen, or if you want to import something that is made from hydrogen. Uh, and one uh, thing again is, is you could say, maybe we produce ammonia somewhere else where there's a lot of renewable electricity and then import the ammonia. Uh, and we already need ammonia for the fertilizer production. So this may be a better option. 
And uh, one thing here that I, I find uh, uh, ca kind of captures this very well is that if you have a molecule of ammonia, that contains more hydrogen than actually a molecule of hydrogen. So if you have it in its, its natural state without when it's not compressed or something, then, then ammonia is, is just a more dense carrier of hydrogen than hydrogen itself. Um, yeah, one thing, of course, also that plays a role here is costs. Um, because uh, right now, uh, if you produce hydrogen in a green, in a clean way, then this is more expensive than fossil fuel-based hydrogen, which is the reason why it's not made very often today. And when we want cheaper green hydrogen, we need basically two things. We need cheap renewable energy. And that is, I mean, you probably know that, that uh, solar power and wind energy already is, is massively cheaper than it used to be a few years ago. And there's still potential that it gets even cheaper. So I, I'm not, not very worried about that. But the other side is we need cheap electrolyzers, like these, basically these machines that turn water into hydrogen. And the, the key here is that technology gets cheaper at scale, right? So if solar power got cheap because we just build lots of it and then, yeah, common processes can be optimized. Um, and I, I think really uh, wind and solar is, is the thing to look at here because that is kind of the success story that, that one may build upon because they, they became cheap basically because some countries started to install solar energy and wind energy uh, at a time where they were not competitive in prices. So, uh, yes, that means this money, yes, or maybe indirectly, I mean, in Germany, we have this renewable energy law where you pay it with your electricity prices, but someone has to pay that. But uh, I think uh, this is uh, really the key, one of the things that needs to happen next when we want to go in that hydrogen direction that uh, you just need to build up these electrolyzers. You need to, to install them. And if you install them in large quantities, then the prices will go down. Yeah. And uh, last, I want to talk a bit about who is currently interested in this space, particularly from the industry and how this discussion is going sometimes. So uh, one of the reasons why, why this discussion is so big right now is that actually the natural gas industry is heavily lobbying in this space and they are trying to influence the discussion. So there are several organizations that are mostly made of, of companies from the natural gas industry that are trying to, to, to form this discussion. And uh, I mean, for one, today, hydrogen production is usually based on natural gas. So naturally, they will say, OK, uh, we can sell you the hydrogen today. It's fossil hydrogen. But uh, and that is something to be on the lookout for. Like today, if someone says, yeah, we, we do this project with hydrogen, I don't know, we use it to power a train or whatever. Um, then very often it is that they are not using green hydrogen, but they are using fossil hydrogen. Also, like there are a few hydrogen gas stations in Germany, for example, and they are also like what you can buy there is fossil hydrogen. Um, and I mean, obviously, that that is not something that makes sense as a climate solution. And then there's also there are two ideas how the industry thinks that they could make a cleaner hydrogen, but still based on on natural gas. Uh, one of these options, which they call blue hydrogen, is that you you, you still make the, the hydrogen like you did before with this steam methane reforming, but you add CCS, which stands for carbon capture and storage, which means you're trying to, to take the CO2 emissions and then store them in underground somewhere. Um, and another process is called methane pyrolysis, where you're chemically splitting up the methane into hydrogen and pure carbon. Um, so uh, both of these processes likely won't mean that you will have uh, zero emissions. Uh, one reason for that is that even uh, drilling for natural gas, um, even drilling for natural gas, 
and transporting it, you will have uh, leaks in pipelines and the, the natural gas itself is the greenhouse gas. Um, the other uh, problem with that is in CCS, you usually don't capture all the emissions, but uh, and the more you capture, the more expensive it becomes. So you may have a situation where you either have something that is very expensive or something that is not much better than the fossil option you had before. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, another thing you can observe right now a lot is that the natural gas industry is pushing for hydrogen in residential heating. So they will tell you, yeah, we, we can right now a lot of uh, houses and flats, they, they use gas boilers for heating and they want to switch that to hydrogen in the future, maybe with an intermediate step of having some mixing in of hydrogen. Um, from, from an efficiency point of view, this does not make a lot of sense. And the reason for that is that just you can use a heat pump with electricity and that is just extremely efficient. So it's very likely that the heat pump will, will cover most of the heating needs in residential heating in the future. Um, but so why are they so focused on this residential heating? And, and I think that the reason is that is this that there's uh, there's a huge natural gas grid, and that consists of very different things. Like you have these huge pipes. This on on the left side here is the Eugal pipeline, which is currently built in Brandenburg. But you also have these all these smaller pipes that go into people's homes. So the natural gas grid is just a huge piece of infrastructure. And uh, if the world gets serious about climate change and re we really massively reduce emissions, then most of this natural gas grid just becomes worthless. So you, you kind of get the idea that if you own such a grid, then you, you're maybe not comfortable with that. Maybe you, you're wondering, what can I do with this in the future? Uh, so I, I think that is where this, this push for residential heating with hydrogen comes from. And the industry basically hopes that they can repropose the natural gas grid for hydrogen. And I mean, don't get me wrong, this is, it's generally a good idea. Like, I mean, it needs some changes in the technology because hydrogen is kind of different from the methane that's usually used in natural gas. But it makes sense to use existing infrastructure when, when you need it. But uh, it, it, but if you look at a scenario, which I think is a likely scenario where you're primarily using hydro hydrogen in industry, then you will not have a large grid. You will not have a national grid and you will definitely not have a grid that goes into residential areas and into people's home. You will much more likely have a smaller grid where you have a hydrogen production facility, maybe close to some renewable energy production, and then maybe it's transported to a steel plant and maybe to a chemical plant, but there's no need for, for this large grid that we have today. So in all likelihood, um, um, even if we, use, if we use hydrogen wisely, then a lot of the natural gas grid will, will just become obsolete. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, to summarize, um, it looks like there's a hydrogen boom coming. And I think this is really good news because we will need it in some areas, but the hydrogen should be used wisely and likely only in sectors where we don't have a better alternative. Um, and also a quick announcement uh, tonight, I, I will do a Q&A session in the, uh, like in cooperation with Hackers Against Climate Change. Uh, where we can discuss this or also other questions around how can we move the whole industry to climate neutral technologies. Uh, a link to a big blue button is in the DVOC wiki. Um, yeah, so that was the talk. And I think now we have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really interesting. And uh, I think it showed us in a nutshell that um, everything is once more much more complicated and complex than uh, some people would like it to be. <laughs> um, yes, we do already have some questions in the pad. If you go to the schedule, you find the, um, the questions pad in, on the detail page of this talk. Uh, you can still enter questions there. 
Um, let's start with one pretty interesting one. Um, is already the claim of natural gas not some kind of greenwashing? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I'm also uh, struggling what terminology to use there. I mean, the natural gas, it always sounds like natural and nice, and but it, it's the term that is used, right? I mean, I sometimes use fossil gas, but uh, it, it's it's a bit difficult when you have an established terminology that that already pushes in that direction. But I, I think also in more general, there it is a problem that that gas has quite a positive reputation because it was for a long time it was pushed as this: it's better than coal, it's better than oil. Uh, where today we can say maybe okay, maybe that's true, but that's not good enough. So yeah. But I agree, natural gas is a problematic term. Hmm. Um, there's a question. Uh, I think you, you already uh, scratched the topic, but probably you have uh, one or two more sentences on the efficacy of uh, hydrogen-powered houses, like uh, a little hydrogen power plant for small houses, uh, even. Um, so I, I currently don't have a number on top of my head. It's just um, if you're like you're I, I mean you already have a, a electricity grid so you already have electricity in your home um when, when it's about heating you can use a heat pump which is you're basically using the energy from from either outside or underground so you have a more than a hundred percent efficiency with a heat pump um I, I cannot put an exact number on this but but there's a massive difference and mm. yeah. Um, there's one long one. Uh, I think I would just read it out. Um, a lot of political actors try to push hydrogen for cars as competition to BEVs, uh, uh, with the, um, um, uh, word of technology betroffenheit, uh, or no, uh, technology offenheit. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, some of them, uh, even suggest using it, uh, to keep the combustion engine alive. Are those people just misinformed or is there a deeper agenda behind this? Uh, okay, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, so, I mean, one thing is that hydrogen cars are not combustion engines. Like they're using fuel cells. They are basically also electric cars. They are just converting hydrogen into electricity. You, in theory, you c could build a car with a combustion hydrogen engine but nobody's doing that. Like that doesn't exist. It, th that's pure fantasy. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 I think, yeah, I mean, I guess, the, I mean, this is a, uh, I think this is a discussion that's a lot happening in Germany uh, because there's this uh, impression that uh, we have a, a large car industry and that is, has a lot of knowledge in, in combustion engines. And there's also the other discussion about e-fuels. All of that is just, it's not plausible from an efficiency and and just the amount of electricity you would need to to pull that off and i, I mean one mm. one thing to keep in mind here is that uh uh we will need a lot of electricity in the future if we want to go to this climate neutral technology and we just cannot afford to add additional inefficiency in there uh but i also think that this this technology often high discussion this this will go away in a few years like this, I, I I know it like like this seems right now for me this is also something where politicians from the conservative and the so-called liberal party try to set some counterpoint where they they have their climate policy that's different from the other but yeah hmm. um, do you think the the whole discussion would benefit from um, more uh, information, more um, uh, yeah, aufklärung for, for all the people that um, that we get to more used to all those technologies um, early on in our lives. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, it's what I'm trying, right? I mean, I write about these <laughs> things, I give the talk. Uh, yeah, of course, like more informed, I, I hope more informed discussion is good. I mean, I, I feel like very often this 
hatte ja this car discussion is is having a very limited perspective where people start to get uh, enraged about lithium mining but then they never talk about oil mining and yeah um yeah 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 Well, we get some more questions in the pub and people are already typing. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what would be something that you would, if you had a wish, what would that be? For this sector, I, I think we, we should start to build these electrolyzers. Like that is the next step that needs to happen. And in, in at large scales. Hmm. Like there was a few days ago, a company from Denmark announced that they want to build one gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity in the Netherlands. Uh, this is the kind of project I would like to see right now. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but probably we can work this out together here. <laughs> um, when to use uh, battery versus hydrogen on off-grid movables? Or why use hydrogen for long distance flights? Um, okay, so it's kind of medium distance flights. The problem is a battery is just too heavy for a long for a flight that goes more than maybe a hundred kilometers. So, so there are some efforts to to, to start battery powered flights, uh, but they will likely be small and short distance. So you have more density with hydrogen than a battery. But it's still less density than than normal fuel. Mm. So we just have a problem in weight for this particular means of movement. Yeah. So you just cannot transport the battery on a long distance flight because it's too heavy. Then, mm. which could possibly uh, change when battery technology evolves. And um, yeah, but there are limits. Like it. it uh, Even if you add, even if you think about tenfold increase in efficiency, that still wouldn't get you across the Atlantic. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I yeah but it. but even the hydrogen plane wouldn't get you across the Atlantic. So. Um, so th this is really a challenging sector. I, I wrote a very long article about it uh, last year. Uh, it, yeah. Hmm. So. Um, I think this this point in there are limits is the thing that should probably uh, reach um, people uh, in politics and wherever there are um, um, that are currently um, moving the the discussion um, in in particular uh, particular um, uh, directions. Yeah. So yeah, uh, thank, I mean, thank you very much if, for your work there. Yeah, if you look at the aviation thing, you you may almost must come to the conclusion that there's no technology where you can just replace the current planes and then go on like before, because you can use e-fuels, but the the scale is just enormous. Like there's a projection that we would use more electricity than all the electricity that's produced today just to power planes. And I just don't think that this is plausible. So mm. we need to talk about that in this very difficult sectors. We also need to talk about reduction. Yeah. There's one last question coming in. Um, I would just uh, wait for uh, whoever's writing to, to finish the sentence. Um, maybe the reminder uh, for the self-organized session uh, in the evening, um, have a look there, uh, hop in and talk to Hanno. Mm. Uh, I think this is a really, really, a great topic to, to keep on uh, our focus. Um, yeah. Yeah, probably typing on, typing on. <laughs> Stopping mid-sentence. <laughs> uh, Hannah, how did you, uh, how did you choose this topic for you? Why did you, uh, Get there. Um, uh, so one thing is that I just noticed that whenever I, I write about hydrogen right now, it it there's a lot of interest. So it seems it's currently just a topic people want to talk about. So yeah. And nobody else um, uh, hit the topic in in that detail. Yeah. Mm. Mm. 
Um, yeah, the question is, uh, if steam, so uh, water vapor um, emissions in large heights, uh, are, they, um, are they also um, climate efficient? Uh, yeah, so, so if you use uh, hydrogen in aviation, that's a problem. Um, I mean, we're talking about technology that doesn't exist yet. Maybe it's possible to somehow capture that and like to just transport the water with the plane. But uh, a, a big problem there is also that there's a lot of uncertainty. Like there's a report from some research, EU research project where they say these, uh, the emissions from aviation are between three and 7%. Like, so we have a 4%, like we have more than 100% uh, uncertainty. And that is because we really don't know how big these water vapor emissions are. They are very hard to model. So one thing there is, yeah, they exist. Uh, they are a problem, but we don't know how big the problem is. Mm. Okay, so uh, in short, we have a lot of two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much, Hanno. Um, uh, we are unfortunately uh, out of time. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, the reminder for the self-organized session in the evening mm -hmm. to uh, go a bit more in depth on this topic and uh, to all your articles you're writing uh, about it. Um, uh, yeah, go to my webpage and they are linked from there all most of them are german so yeah but i can we have the l and can put the here's the link yeah yeah okay so um thank you again and um have a a wonderful divok yeah thanks <laughs>